Hello everybody, my name is, as you probably know from the slide, Miro Nurmela, and today I will be speaking about uh, this topic, which is how to be a technical person in a cross-disciplinary team. Before we get started, let's start with a small uh, uh, quiz. What is happening in this picture? Let's take, uh, take it from Helsinki. What is happening in this picture? It's, a, it's, it's not a trick question. There's, a, there's an answer to this question. Jussi. You're programming something for the screen on the shoe. So you're programming a shoe. Th that is partially, partial credit. I'm actually installing a Linux distribution on this shoe in order to program the shoe. <laughs> it, the shoe didn't come with the screen or the uh, operating system installed. Uh, that is fun and games, but what is actually important about this picture is that it happened one week or two before or after this image was taken that I had a bloody argument in my team, which consisted of me, a, a mechanical engineer, a graphic designer, and a marketing person. And we were, in fact, designing a smart shoe, as you can tell from this picture. The shoe is not very smart, and it broke down immediately after this installation was complete. That is besides the point. The point is that we had had a bloody argument over whether ideas are more important than implementation. It was a shouting match between me and the designer at the time, and uh, it didn't really go well. Because one, it really doesn't matter which is more important because it's a value question. It doesn't matter for the purpose, but we thought it was very important to shout to each other about this question. And you can probably tell from this example that, that during this time I probably wasn't a very good technical person in a cross-disciplinary team. I was a technical person in a cross-disciplinary team, but I was doing really poorly. The story has a happy ending because we did design a shoe and I did become a teacher of this topic in the university. So I later gained some experience on how to handle this situation how, and how to work in a cross-disciplinary team. So that's why I'm here to talk to you about it. And that is, I am, in this presentation, I'm the guy who has worked with in a cross-disciplinary team. And I did install Linux to Azure. So, so we are gonna follow a classic three-act structure here with, the pre, with an intro of the prelude. So uh, let, let's get our facts straight first. What, what are we talking about? then the motivation, why are we here, then the actual content, and then there's in the end, as in all good speeches, there's a call to action. So wait, for, wait look forward to that. So what is a cross-disciplinary team? And you probably have heard this, but let's get what we are talking here straight. A cross-disciplinary team is a team that consists of different disciplines. In the context of futurists and most digital consultancies, it means that there is a the technical person, aka a programmer, there's a designer, be it a strategic or graphic designer, some sort of design background, and then there is a person who works for in, the, in the business domain, doing business analysis or marketing or something. And of course, we are now looking at the intersection of all those three, or you know, it, it could be only two of those, but the lessons we are going to talk about here apply to all of them. Uh, so, why are we talking about this? Well, this slide is wiped from a uh, futurist presentation we presented last week in the, in a, in a, in, uh, during our internal, internal event. And it's about, it has this on, on, the, on your right hand side, the, one of our offerings is that we offer multidisciplinary teams. And it is in our core here at this company where we employ all designers, business people and technology people that we have this capability. So, this is, should be very important for us, and how to work in those teams is something that uh, should be very integral to us. But this is, this is unfortunately the, the facts of the situation that it's very hard to work in a cross-disciplinary team. The hard has, there are many reasons for that, we are gonna go to them, but communication is hard, it's hard to organize work. Uh, usually if you are working in a cross-disciplinary team, you're working with hard problems. Why would you need a cross-disciplinary team if you're working on simple problems? If you need to build a website that shows HTML, you don't need a designer and you don't need somebody to sell it. But the cross-disciplinary teams exist for the purpose of solving difficult problems. And by definition, difficult problems are hard to solve. So but it follows that working with cross-disciplinary teams on hard problems is hard. So it's like it, it doesn't get, it, 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 it's not a miracle remedy but it, offer, it gives tools to work on the hard problems. It doesn't make it harder, any easier though. All right, so here we stand, faced with the, with the daunting task of taking our, our cross-disciplinary team, facing a hard problem, and we need to solve it. 
Can you imagine what is the first problem that you will run into? I know, I, I know everybody knows the answer. <laughs> yeah, somebody shouted, you mess up. It's always a danger, which is true. Uh, I'll start with a big one. The big one is communication. And if you have ever talked to anyone, even with your friends or your family, you probably know this. You try to convince them, you try to tell them, hey, how was Christmas, mom? And mom is like, it was pretty fine. And you're like, pretty fine? It was really great. And mom is like, why is he asking for Christmas? Christmas is like, it, it was fine. Did he think it's wrong? Like, communication even with the people you know is very hard. But people in co but communication in cross-disciplinary teams is very difficult because of the following reasons. Uh, it's really because... Communication is, of course, always based on shared values and like shorthands. For example, as a technical person, if I sh say the first sentence in Finnish in this slide, which, is which, which goes, this jack is going to work just fine, assuming the pig doesn't choke and the lambdas of Bezos don't fail us, it makes sense if you are a technical person and speak Finnish. It doesn't make any sense if you are a non-technical person and don't speak Finnish. So it's really sort of, these, these are the... Better, why are you signing? No, All right. <laughs> ah. No, oh, whatever. Pe Pedro is complaining about the volume. We'll, we'll, we'll keep going. So, there is no communication shorthands for, to, for you to use necessarily in a cross disciplinary team because you don't know what the pig is and you don't know what, what Bezo who Bezos is necessarily or how does it relate to lambdas, which are obviously about lambda calculus, which is obviously about mathematics. So, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, this is a very thi in interesting thing that, <laughs> that, you, you, that you'll find when you are wor working with, with different disciplines, especially if you come from purely engineering background, is that words mean different things for different people. If a designer says it's done, it doesn't mean that it's working and deployed to your, to your production service, which is probably w w what you would say when it's done. A system, a design system, is not the same as a software system. And if you are not very specific in your use of, use of words, you will be interpreting what the things and the words they say in the wrong way. I got the reputation during my time as a teacher of, of this matter in the university for always asking, what do you mean? And it was very annoying for all the people around me because when they said, yeah, let's go for lunch, and I was like, what do you mean? They would be really annoyed by that, but it reduced the amount of communication mishaps a lot. Because when people say, let's build a system, and you ask, well, what do you mean? And they tell me, we need to build a design framework, or we need to build a sales plan as the system. And you're like, well, the system includes databases and you know, front ends and back ends and other technical jargon. So it's really important to get on the same page with everybody. And language is very important in that regard. And you have, you have to know that you speak a different one when you are entering this combat of uh, cross-disciplinary landscape. Which leads to the next point, which is that, well, initially you won't share a language because you come from different backgrounds, but in a project you should strive to create one. Sort of concepts in a, in a, in a project become concepts. They have a technical part and they will have a uh, design part and they will do something for marketing, but we don't know what they are now before the project starts, but when they become to existence, you can call them something and then you can communicate with the shorthands. But you must know that when the project starts with the different people you didn't know before, they don't exist. And you can tell good teams from the bad teams from the fact that at some point during the, the project, those will come about and they will exist. The last point is, harkens back to, the, to, the, to my, my anecdote in the beginning. Uh, you have to be able to agree to disagree. Some people will, will tell you that they think that ideas are more important than impl implementation, you might disagree. It, it doesn't mean that they're wrong, and it definitely doesn't mean that you're right, but it means that you really need to sort of ag agree that, hey, you have your point of view, it makes sense. I have my point of view, also makes sense. Let's shake hands, hop to the fields, and be very happy about it, and move on to our project, because the, the, the things that you disagree about that are not like actual problems for the project and the problem you're solving, just Leave them out. They are not part of the part of the, the problem. 
And one uh, more note about communication. Communication is always sort of the, the processed thinking process of any, any one human being, especially in sort of, a, sort of when you're talking to foreign people, by me, the other disciplines I mean in this context, they will express something, but behind those words is always much more. And it is your job as the technical person to dig into those and sort of like figure out what it means for you in your context and sort of translate them to the words, that you, words and concepts that you understand. So don't be afraid to sort of like, don't sort of like, don't dismiss the things that are told to you in, on face value, dig deeper, communicate, and sort of build understanding. Mm. And then what to do? Some practical tips to take home from this, from the, from this exercise. So first one is, of course, be verbose. No one ever complained about too much communication, except if it's, if it's stupid. But if you, make, if you are making points and communicating, like, that it, like the too much communication is an easier problem to fix than too little communication. It's always easier to not send that one flow doc message, but it's much e sort of like the starting to, to communicate more is much harder. The second point is obvious, but needs, re needs reiterating. And the, the quote from Richard Feynman, a famous physicist, which tells that if you can't explain things simply, then you don't know them very well. And in order to sort of, sort of attack this problem of communication, especially if you are to co uh, convince other people that you are know what you're doing, you have to be able to pr uh, articulate yourself very clearly. You have to be expert in your field. And then the third one is also very important related to the values one. You can easily lose, lose projects, you can lose games as individuals. It's much easier to win as teams. Check your ego at the door. It's not about making you look good. It's not about making other people look bad. It's not a competition within the team. You are in, you are in the same boat. They are from the different disciplines. Doesn't matter. They are on your team now and you are to help them. You are to help each other to, to win this game or the project or whatever. The last point to segue to the, to the next, next slide. So know your role, both sort of what is expected from you and also in the temporal context. Uh, we're gonna talk about temporal context soon, but we're first gonna talk about the roles. So this is the classical reason why we should do cross-disciplinary teams. So different disciplines bring different things to the table. Design, desi design people bring desirability. They can design p things that people want and not know how to use, and people love them. M business people, usually, they are concerned about viability. Your product might be the best, but if it's not sort of economically viable, it's not really a product, it's a bankruptcy probably for you in that case. And then in this classical uh, trifecta, the technical people's role is to look after feasibility, because people come up with ideas that might be impossible to implement so if there's no one to tell them that like, this, this is a bad idea, then, you know, also, also bankruptcy. The, this, this view of uh, what the technical person should do in a cross-disciplinary team is, uh, is a fine one. It's a level zero explanation, basically, because it has a negative tone. It, it tells that your task is to tell if something is possible or not. And while it is true, I don't think it's the extent of what, what your role is. And we'll get back to what I think it should be in the, in the later, later slide. Uh, and this is now a little bit more about the temporal dimension. So, as said, uh, cross disciplinary teams usually tackle hard problems. Hard problems, uh, projects that tackle hard problems usually take place over time, and they have different phases. The image on the screen is the classic double diamond. First, when you start a new project, you first uh, diverge. You look for new ideas. Then you converge on some of them. You try them out. Okay, you try something, you, you converge, uh, di uh, diverge again and then you converge to a final solution. This is a classic uh, design approach to making products. Uh, and then, of course, there is this, uh, somebody someone might know this from our, for example, from the LSC framework, that you first immerse yourself in the problem, you make research, you make benchmarking, then you build prototypes, MVPs, and then the actual products, and you might kill the product in, the, in between. Uh, what you must know, of course, that projects or not always look, go the way you want them to. There's sometimes things happen and you go back and forth. 
So like the temporal dimension might get really, really mixed up and you might travel back in time. You, you, you think you're releasing your first version, but then you're back to MVP phase or back to, back to the pro, sort of the immersion phase. That those things happens, happen. But it is important to know what you should be doing at these times as a technical person. And these are like uh, pointers to get you started with, with, for example, in the beginning, your, your task is, will be to find options. You're looking for how to solve these problems. You're trying to figure out what is the problem. And then as a technical person, you will be looking for enablers. How can we solve this? Is it already solved? What, what are the things that we're measuring options? Is this better than the other one? When you're starting building, building the first MVPs, then you will be implementing prototypes. You will be test that this, this, this is where you actually do the feasibility, feasibility part. Is it possible to implement the things that we studied that we need? And of course, there's this sort of testing the designs part because it's sort of designs. Everybody has a plan until they get, they get punched in the face, said the great philosopher Mike Tyson. And the punching on, on the face starts when you start implementing things. Does, do, do, the, do the APIs provide you input in a reasonable time? Do you need to implement more spinners? Oh my god, all our users are actually using IE6. We, we can't use our features we wanted to. Like things will change f after they leave the, the, the drawing board of the designers. And of course, then there is the, some would call the actual engineering work. When we, you do proper engineering, you make p build pipelines and test suites and integration tests and like database migrations and all, all that things that you do when you're actually programming. So th there's that part in this, in this job too. Why is it important to know these steps? is that because if this happens to you and you move back and forth in time, then your requirements change. If you were already implementing your product and then you realize that, oh, oh crap, everything's come wrong and we need to start over in the beginning, you cannot stay in the same mindset you were in. You are not building the product anymore. You are researching a new product. So like, be aware of where you are moving in, the, in this scale and what's your, what is your role in temporal access in, in this sense. And yeah, as I promised, we're going to talk a little bit about the next level. So if the, the level zero is feasibility, the next level is enab enabling. And why? Well, because technology moves really fast. Everybody knows there's a, there was two months ago, blockchain was really interesting. Now nobody cares about that anymore. Now it's all about AI, which is like programming, but you know, fancier because that's what we people are doing, doing for a long time. So, but anyway, now, now, now that is the next, next big thing, machine learning. Like, these are things that change how we work. And these provide opportunities that didn't exist one year ago. And it is your job as a technical person to know what is up there. You don't have to know them. You don't have to necessarily know exactly how to implement them. But you have to be aware. Because when you are presented with a problem that is sort of solved by a so thing that you don't know exists, then you can't solve that problem. You need to be on the on the edge, on the bleeding edge. And then sort of, yeah, it's your responsibility then. Like if you are the technical person, people will look, look onto you to know, 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 know the latest things. So all right. Uh, yeah, let's I'm gonna call you to action and then we're gonna have a discussion about these matters. Uh, what I want to happen. And what I want to see from in the future at Futurist and in, in all the other places is that technical people, as well as all the other people, all the other disciplines would be involved do, throughout the whole journey. Because better, best solutions will come when you are all available during the bro project. It is not optimal that the designers design in the research phase and then they fade out because when you get punched in the face, what are you gonna do? Then you are in charge of the design because you are there. But it shouldn't be like that. You should be able to iterate the designs, the business plans, the everything should be done, iterated throughout the project. And if you are not part of the whole process, so say if you got into the project after the research phase, then when the plans change and the designer has vanished, what do you do? If you don't have the touch points that you gained in the beginning when you were researching the problem, your solutions will not be optimal. But if you were there, at least you have a fighting chance 
of getting, getting it right because you know at least where the solutions came from in the first place. So this is for you to demand to be a part of this process. And of course, hop onto my P-shaped WAN. Of course, everybody knows what's a T-shaped person. It's a person with one deep level of knowledge and then a good, good amount of like, sort of, I don't know, basic knowledge, general knowledge, whatever. A, a pie-shaped person would have two, two uh, areas of deep knowledge or two areas of not so deep knowledge. I don't know. This, this metaphor is falling apart fast, so let's move on. But if you are a part of this cross disciplinary team, th th these teams, you will pick up other skills. You have to. You, ha you are a designer then. You are a business person. And this is how you can sort of like, these are things that you can bring to your own problem sol solving skills as a technical person, because not all problems are technical problems. And if you can spot those, then you are like v way above the like level zero technical, per technical person. But also, <coughs> excuse me, also, uh, it's fun. It's really fun to work with course on a team. You get challenged, you have to look at your own views, you have to like let, to let other people know what, what they are doing. So even though I had a bloody fight with, with my friends during the, that, that one project, they're still my friends and I love them, so. Anyway, that was, that was for me. We have uh, six minutes for discussion and then we are gonna hear about React without React, so thank you. Questions? Jokes? Can you hear me in the middle? Parsa on the stage? Any, any of this? I have a joke. Go. I heard that bleeding edge technologies is when the developer bleeds. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can see how that works. I'll take it. Very good, sir. Thanks for the presentation. It was pretty good. Thanks, Pet. Any, any of the offsides? In Tampere, Tampere, someone's trying to ask something, but we can't hear anything. Turn up the volume. Turn up the volume. We, we can't hear Tampere. Let's. Ah, now now we can hear it. Like it's it's very low. Can you wait? How can I? I don't know. How about now? Is it me? Michael is on it. Wait one second. That was a second. All right, hey, now we can hear you. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> so first of all, thank you so much for that. Um, you won me over with the Feynman quote, so I'm totally on board with you. Um, I think it's interesting that so much of what we do is is storytelling. Now, Feynman, was course, of course, was a master storyteller, as uh, as is every science communicator, and. And we tell stories every day. We tell stories in SVSs about users, and we tell stories when we write code to other coders. And in our daily stand-ups, we tell stories to the POs and each, and each other. And I think that is a really essential skill for everybody. Do you? What would you say? How? How does one become a better storyteller? That is a, a very, very interesting question. Uh, I'm gonna quote Mr. Stephen King, uh, a very famous storyteller who has written, written a book about writing. Uh, in, in his opinion, in order to become a good writer, uh, aka a storyteller, you have to one, read a lot. So you have to, in this context, you would have to listen. You would have to like take notes when other people are talking. And the second, second point to Mr. King's uh, how, to, how to become a storyteller is to, is to tell stories and sort of, it's it's a it's a non-answer in a way that it doesn't tell you how to how to tell good stories, but it's an answer in in the in the regard that uh, the first step towards being good at anything is sucking at something, and in order to become a good storyteller, I in the sort of the te in, the, in the technical sense, practice. Like if you want to write code, you need to write code. If you want to do daily stand-ups, you need to do daily stand-ups. Uh, I would, uh, I would, uh, if if you want more more practical advice, how how to how to become become better is to always feel feedback from your for your, from your colleagues. Also, a really obvious answer, but I, I know that many people don't do that. For example, for daily stand-ups, when like after you had had a meeting, just just feel two minutes of feedback, 
and see, see what you did, could do better at the next time. So, And you should also probably read On Writing by Stephen King. That's a practical book note. It's, it's a short book. Good one. Thank you, Miro.